back with Judge Thomas. Yeah. Judge Thomas, you're now sitting in the Bronx Supreme Court. You told us all about that in part one. You're now yeah. at Bronx Supreme, well, and criminal court at that, right? Criminal court, yeah. I, How yeah. long did you sit in criminal court in the Bronx? I was there for two years. After that, where did you go? You know, before I go to that, I'd like to tell you an interesting story about the, from the criminal court. Okay? A couple of years ago, I went to a fundraiser for retired basketball players from the NBA and Licks and whatever. It was, a, I forgot the organization that ran it, but it was a, a wonderful old event to see all these old time guys who I, who I knew by name only. And there was a fellow sitting in the corner all by himself. And I asked, who was this guy? And they told me his name is Freddie Crawford. He used to play for the Knicks. Now, I knew that Freddie Crawford was the guy from the Bronx, and I was from the Bronx. Anyway, he was all alone. I went over there, and I sat down, and we started to, to chat. I said, well, uh, tell me something, Fred. Who was the, the best ball player you ever played against in, in the NBA? He said, no question about it, Kareem. Kareem was absolutely the best. I said, well, how about in high school? I knew he went to Gompers High School. He said, I don't know. He says, high school? I said, I, I don't remember anybody from high school. I said, well, I'll tell you who I thought was the best player I ever saw in high school. It was Herman Taylor from Commerce High School. He says, Herman Taylor? He says, he's a good friend of mine. I said, well, whatever happened to him? He says, well, he... Uh, he played for the, uh, he went to LIU for a while. And he, he was a Harlem Globetrotter. He's known as Honey Taylor. Oh boy, very impressive. I said, okay, now you, I, that's your Herman Taylor. I'll tell you my Herman Taylor. I'm it's sitting in the Bronx. Now we're back to, back to reality. I'm sitting in the Bronx and uh, it, it's in arraignments and they call out a guy from the pens and it comes out, Herman Taylor. I look up and, uh, I had the whole audience full of people, and they were all sort of sleeping. They don't, they're they not paying attention. And I said, Herman Taylor. I said, are you Herman Taylor that, that used to play for Commerce High School? He said, yes. But he looks, now everybody's attention. <laughs> I have them all listening now. I said, wow. I said, are you the Herman Taylor who was really one of the finest ball players of his era? He looked down, he didn't answer, he mumbled. I said, so this is what has come to Herman. This is what has come to. I was, you know, get me sentimental about the whole thing because hey, this was a guy who I really looked up to. Anyway, the attorney, the attorney says, "Come on, can I approach you?" He comes up. I said to the attorney, "You know, you know who your client is?" I said, "He was spectacular." He says, "Yeah, he may have been a good basketball player, but he's a lousy gambler." So then I knew what it was a gambling. He was probably picked up in a crap game. We're not talking about a murder case here, okay? So I said, okay. I took care of the case. I don't remember the disposition at all, all right? Now, let's go back to Freddie Crawford. I'm told, then years later, uh, I told him the story. I mean, we're, we're laughing about it. A couple of weeks later, my phone rings at home. Hello, Judge Thomas? Yes. Who is this? This is Herman Taylor. Herman Taylor? I can't, you're calling me. Yeah. Oh, Trini told me the story. He said, I remember that so well. He says, oh, how are you, Judge? How you doing? How's your family? Tell me about yourself. He's interested in me. I couldn't believe it. And uh, I think he's still around. Um, and he was a hell of a ball player. And it's, it's, it's not just a side story, but um, it's a good one. To, me, to me, that was a perk on the job. That There was something really interesting. You know? That, that was, sounds like it. Any other celebrities come in front of you? Those were like, that was like a celebrity to you. Yeah, well, I had I had Al Sharpton on an appeal situation. That wasn't much. Although Al Sharpton can be very funny. Al Sharpton is a close relative to a judge on the bench right now. And he was at our swearing-in ceremony. He came in, he said, you know, ladies and gentlemen, this is the first time I ever went into a courthouse through the front door. <laughs> I thought that was pretty amusing. The other celebrities... An, an original rapper. These are the breaks. You know that guy said, "These are the breaks." Who, whoever that guy was. Do you, do you know who that was? I gotta look it up. Pick, pick him up. Pick him up. These are the anyway. He's been around quite a while. You're gonna sing the song. You're gonna lovely. You're gonna sing it. You can actually sing. <laughs> that's how. That's how I know the guy. All right. Uh, 
You know, I, otherwise, I can't think of any other celebrities. Well, and they don't have too many celebrities in, the, in Queens. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's I know that's where you sat for a long time, right? Is that yeah. progression? Yeah. Well, oh, yeah, that was it. After after um, the Bronx, I, then, I went to the criminal court in, in Queens for a couple of years. And then I was I was a civil court judge at the time, and then I was let. Then I was acting supreme for a while, and then I went to supreme. And when I was in supreme, I did criminal for about six or seven years, and then I was doing both criminal and civil, which I thought was really the best way to go. I loved that idea. Why? To, to judge it, oh, I get the variety. You really get the variety, and um, it's every day is exciting. You don't know what's going to be. The case comes in. You know, it's it's it's, it's um, it made it made life interesting. It's funny that you say that, Lance, like because you know, yeah, because it's clear that you 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 loved your job, and you say, "Wow, it was very exciting. Every day was interesting." But I've been doing this for twenty nine years, and most of the time when I go in front of judges, not every judge, but most of the judges I go in front of, I don't get the idea that they think it's very exciting and very interesting. You know what I mean? I know what you mean. They get you, especially if you do the same thing every single day. Uh, frankly, I was getting bored hearing my own voice sometimes. When I was picking juries, I only wanted to do it once with one panel. I didn't want to go through a couple of panels to hear this, hear my voice again. But um, then I, 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 went, I got involved in the guardianship case in World, Article 81. And that was extremely rewarding because you really can make a difference in that part. So, why I, you, I, I, so, so you and I both know what that is. I mean, obviously... Yeah. But yeah. maybe, maybe, maybe somebody other than my mom who may listen to this doesn't know this. It doesn't know what that is. Why don't you explain that? We have a guardianship uh, law which provides for people who have functional limitations, and if they can't do the perform the basic functions of everyday living, I, I, somebody will come in and step in, and can come in and step in and and petition to be their guardian to make these decisions, either financial or or personal. They come to court and they make an application. They prove their case. They prove that the that the person we call them an AIP, an allegedly incapacitated person, it does not have the capacity to do what to, to function yeah, correctly. Maybe they were being exploited. Maybe there's a mental issue. There are a lot of situations why they why you would get one and be a guardian, and uh, you make that determination. You send send out an investigator, a court evaluator. Come back with a report. You have a hearing on the matter, and then you make a determination whether or not the person needs a guardian. Number one, and number two, who should be the guardian? You no, know, that's pretty cool stuff. And I, let me see if I if, if I could kind of summarize it. So essentially, when you became the judge in this guardianship part, people are coming to you and they're saying, "Hey, Judge Thomas, we think we've got someone here that needs representation that can't function on their own and needs to need somebody in there." And oftentimes, there's someone on the other side saying, well, maybe not, right? And you're the one that decides, hey, whether whether this person should or shouldn't have a guardian appointed. And oftentimes there's a fight over that, right? Absolutely. Usually in, in the family situation, if it's very common, it's the who loves mama the most. Which which is, uh, child wants to take care of mama, which one doesn't? Things of that nature. And uh, it, you're dealing with the human condition, the very basic human condition. Which reminds me, if you'd like to hear an interesting story, I got one for you. That's what I'm here for. That's what I'm okay. Th this one, this is a case that came up in the guardianship world uh, early on in my in my career. It made an impression that I, I've never forgot this matter. Just picture this. It came to me. A, a very rich Chinese woman died with a lot of jewelry. And she had a guardian, and she also had a lot of relatives, and she did not have a will. And so she had two, two groups of relatives. One group of relatives said they wanted her jewelry. The other group said, we don't want her jewelry. We want, she wanted to have her jewelry buried with her. And she was being helped. They weren't burying her until, until this was settled. So this is a, an odd situation. Bury your jewelry. Okay, so the first thing I did was I did a little research. I I, I Googled Chinese burial customs. And it turned out 
that it, it is a custom in certain situations that that people wanted their jewelry buried with them. And the word was, if they liked their jewelry. That was the word, if they liked their jewelry. I then asked my administrative judge, who was happened to be Chinese, uh, Randy Yang, a terrific guy. Um, he became a, a, a PJ of the Appellate Division, Second Department. I said, Randy, what do you think? This, he said, well, he said, if they like their jewelry, he said that the same words, if they like their jewelry, you know, it happens, they ought to do that. Okay, so now we have a hearing, and we have the guy on the stand, the, the guardian on the stand, and because he, 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 he doesn't know what to do. He said, well, I'm going to, I said to him, well, suppose you take a picture of the jewelry and um, put it in, it, oh, no, no, that won't work at all. I said, um, I said, well, you know what's going to happen? If you put that to those jewels in that in the coffin and bury them, when you walk out of that cemetery, someone's going to come back with a shovel and can dig it out. He said, if that happens, bad things will happen to them. I said, well, that's not good enough for me because if I let that happen, bad things will happen to me. <laughs> so, then well, what do I do? What do I do? Well, you're the lawyer. What do you think I did? Oh, boy, you put me on the spot? Yeah. Uh, you know, I uh, I don't know, uh, replica jewelry? <laughs> I, mean, I, don't know. I, I thought of that. I thought of that. They, I, I, I even mentioned that. No, they didn't want that. I'll tell you what I did. Yeah. Um, I said to the group that wanted the jewelry and the, the, that wanted to bury them, I said, you want to bury the jewelry? Okay. But you're all part of the estate. You're right. There was no will. They were all, they were all beneficiaries. They were all distributees, I should say. And uh, I said, well, you, you buy the jewelry. Well, you buy the jewelry. Give me the money. Give us. And then you can take the jewelry and do anything you want with it. But now we still have the estate. That's how, that's how we settled it out. Did they go for that? Did they? Did they? They do went it? for it. Absolutely, they went for it. Now I wasn't around. To, I, I didn't go to the funeral. I don't. You know. I don't. Know how to, my my involvement. I, mean, I I should have lost jurisdiction because when somebody dies, it goes to the surrogate's court, not the Supreme Court. But sure. I, this was winding down the guardianship. So, so I don't know how it eventually ended up. But I know that was the solution, and they seem to be happy with it. That's a and great story. Yeah, very, very uh, a, a different take on the old Solomon-esque uh, story yeah. with yeah. the baby, right? Wow. Exactly. Wow. Yeah, exactly. That's uh, that's that's pretty interesting. I, I don't think I've ever heard anything quite like that. I never saw one like that before myself. But it, it was it was it was fascinating. Well, there were a lot of little stories like that. You want stories? I'll give you a story. Let's get, let's hear stories. All right. We had an old lady who lived in a house with a big fence around it. And she had a daughter that lived in the house with her and, and a daughter that lived down the street. So we had an in, in daughter and out daughter. And the in daughter and the out daughter were fighting all the time as to who loves mama the most, who's going to do this, who's going to do that. And the in daughter, by the way, was, was the guardian. And she was not letting her sister, it was, it was her sister, come and visit. So one day, when the sister, when the inn was not around, the out daughter came along, jumped the fence, went in, and saw our mother, and had to break a window to get in. In the sister came, the other one came back, called the police, and the police came and she told them a story, and they arrested. The, the system of breaking into the house. They took it they, to the police station. They held her overnight and then around the morning she came back to the house and, and she found that Mama had died in the night. So what did she do? The first thing she did was she took a camera and took pictures of Mama in the bed with her bed sores, horrible looking pictures. And, and now it's all in front of me right now. A bad story. In any event, but now we have, we have a hearing about the whole thing she was fighting about, but with the sister 
You know what? I don't even remember what they were fighting about anymore, but they were fighting. They were fighting. It was in front of me, and I had to wrap up the whole thing and uh, terminate the guardianship. And we had a hearing, and the, the cop, a cop came in to testify that he had arrested this the number out system. The cop came in wearing a pair of shorts. I had never seen that before in a courtroom. Uh, the cop comes in in, in shorts. And he, gets, and he gets on the stand, and he he he, he tells a story. Well, he, he, didn't, he, he made it sound like the assistant from outside was terrible, and the one inside was 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 right. And he walked by when the case was, when the testimony was over. The sister who was sitting in the courtroom, the outside, she looks up and says, him, "You lying son of a bitch." I never heard that in the courtroom either, frankly, between the people. Okay, they walk out, and I found, oh, I know, now I remember why I was there. It was a contempt citation uh, against the in-sister for not letting the out-sister visit. So I was holding her in contempt because I had given her the right to visit. And this, this sister number, in-sister, in I gave her a, a week in jail as a contempt, which I, on the weekend, I knew she'd only do two or three days. Meanwhile, the out sister went out into the hall and had an epileptic fit, and they had to call an ambulance. I mean, it was a lot, a lot, of, a lot of drama. But, okay, that was just an exciting day. It, it sounds like you, in that position, you're the position you were in in that guardianship part for all those years, that you got to see the family dramas really played out in an open, in a public fashion. Like, Every one of us has these family dramas we all go through. I know you've had your own, and you know some of mine. But you see it, you see it really just splayed out in court, huh? Absolutely. The human condition laid out in front of you, which makes it so interesting. It really does. To my mind, that was much more interesting than, than the negligence cases than the guy saying, uh, it hurts, give me money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's my kind of case. How in the world does that, that not affect your demeanor? You are the same... Just happy, open-minded, energetic, passionate. Per you, you know, I see judges. I say, "Wow, this judge, he's a little jaded, and he's tired of doing this." And he doesn't. Want you have ne that your demeanor has never changed, even now, all these years later, despite hearing all those stories all that time. That's pretty amazing. Nature of the beast. What can I tell you? I love the job, and uh, it's the best job in the world. 